uh, let's talk quickly about self-injurious behavior. This, in my clinical experience in the last 10, 12, 15 years, this comes and goes, right? We see rashes of this um, at certain times and then we don't see as much of it for a while. And sometimes a particular school will be hit, be hit really, really hard by it um, and then not as bad. What is your current, I know you, uh, many of you, most of you raised your hand that you had worked with students who self-injured. What's your sense of, of how it is right now? Is it a particularly big issue in most of your schools right now? Okay. Okay, and it does, like I said, it comes and goes. Um, so self-injurious behavior is also called non-suicidal self-injury at times, um, is an intentional infliction of injury without a specific suicidal intent. Um, it can be cutting, it can be burning, scratching, carving, piercing. Some, you know, there'll be times when you'll see a whole bunch of uh, kids engaging in like pretty severe eraser burns, for example, for a while, right? It's a form of self-injury. It may happen only once, um, and it may happen chronically. And it happens, uh, this is again, we were talking about this over one of the breaks, but it is a common misconception that it really uh, happens really only in women, and only very, very rarely in men, and that's not the case. It happens with both men and women. And in fact, um, prior to about third or fourth grade, it's more common in boys than it is with girls, and then it shifts after about fourth grade. Um, and what we know is that it's also gotten younger and younger and younger, probably partly due to kind of media attention and those contagion factors. But uh, the, one of the studies suggests that it starts as early as seven, six, seven years old in some kids. Eight percent of third graders and up to 20 percent of high schoolers have engaged in self-injury, intentional self-injury at some point. Um, when I do, uh, a few years ago, a couple school systems had us come in and do specific trainings to their um, school staff because they were having extremely high rates of self-injury. And uh, there were so many, so many classroom teachers who just didn't understand it, who didn't get it. It makes no intuitive sense to us, most of us as adults, why kids would intentionally hurt themselves. And so what's the assumption that we tend to make? that it's about what? Suicidal behavior. One, that's one. What's another one? Attention. That it's just for attention. And so we tend to either react to it as if it were um, a, bo uh, a botched suicide attempt um, and lock kids up for two or three nights on the behavioral health unit, or we tend to way underreact and assume that it's just their way of getting attention. It's a manipulative sort of behavior. So what you should know not just about attention. I will not say that attention is not a factor in it some of the time because it obviously is. And we know that because there's a pretty wide range of places that people cut and how obvious they let it be to others that they're cutting, right? But the primary factor, the primary motivation, the function of this for most people is not primarily about attention. Although it's not a suicidal behavior in and of itself, it can be a risk factor for suicide. Do you know why? Well, because they can cut too deep. Right, so there's two reasons. One is exactly that. The, the kids tend to self-injure when they're in periods of emotional stress, emotional distress. So that means that they're not thinking particularly clearly anyway, and they're carving away at parts of their body where there's a lot of blood flow um, while emotionally distressed and mis mistakes can be made. So that's number one. Number two is that we find that over time it, get, it takes more and more intense injury to get the same level of relief. And so people tend to up the ante, which then puts them at risk for, for suicide. Um, it is linked to anxiety, depression. It's been linked to bullying. Um, it's linked to eating disorders. It's more common among uh, people who are diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. There, it occurs at higher rates in sexually abused individuals, but it would be a mistake to assume sexual abuse just because somebody self-injures. So it's one of those things, right? It occurs among people who don't, who haven't been sexually abused, and people who have. So um, it, higher rates. And we do know that there's a contagion effect. So we do know that we have to be cautious in terms of how we address this at a school level because studies have shown 
that if you do what we normally do when we have a problem in a school and you address it in a psychoeducational sort of way and you provide information, you provide maybe some videos and an assembly, the rates go up. So you have to respond to this particular behavior in a different way in a school setting in particular. Something else is that's really unfortunate is kind of the social fads that happen, and I don't know if you all have experienced that in your schools, but it's something that some kids just get together and they do, and it's right. unfortunate, and you have, it's, it, there's kind of a fine line when you're trying to treat them for therapy and knowing that they're doing this as a, as a socially acceptable thing with their peers. Right. So that's something else that, that I've seen quite a bit of as a therapist. Absolutely. And, and then they sort of challenge each other and they up the ante for each other and, and, and have certain levels of expectation sometimes. One thing that I found too, uh, a couple of years ago is they follow certain people on Instagram. You know, use the social media type things that promote self-injury or cutting, that type right. of thing. I had some students that were, that's who they were following on Instagram. Absolutely. And, and this is the one exception today where I am not showing a video, um, not, not specifically for that reason, but because <clears throat> there's a lot of research about triggers for, for self-injury. And we know that the proportion uh, of, of our population who has at one point or another self-injured is very high. So the odds are reasonable that somebody in this room has at some point in their life. You show a video of kids self-injuring of those particular injuries, um, and it can be triggering to people in recovery from self-injury. So we don't tend to go around randomly, <laughs> randomly showing videos of it for that reason. <clears throat>